What's up guys, Michael Corsentino with my November 2018 lighting tutorial for Shutter Magazine and BehindTheShutter.com. In this video, I'm going to cover a topic that I've spoken about before, and that is balancing ambient and flash. And I think this topic is worth revisiting from time to time because whenever I speak with someone who is new to photography or new to flash, uh, they are definitely confused by how to do this and they find it to be a challenging topic to wrap their heads around. So uh, we're going to revisit it with some new photographs. We're going to show you uh, before and afters and show you kind of how you can control uh, how to wrap your head around exactly what you're doing when you're balancing flash and ambient and uh, the, the methods that you use to control uh, each of them in the best way. So to accomplish this, we're going to look at a shoot that I recently did in Orlando, Florida, this fashion shoot that you're looking at here with model Nathan Waters. Uh, and you can see here on the left and the right, we've got two images, both produced with flash, but both with very different looking amounts of ambient and flash in each. On the left, you've got a much more natural balance of light between ambient and flash. And on the right, we've got a lot less ambient light and uh, it's, it's much more of a dramatic kind of image. The amount of flash is the same, but the amount of ambient has been significantly reduced. And I'm going to show you how to do that. That is really the only difference that you're looking at here between these two images is the amount of ambient light. First, let's take a quick look at the gear that I used on this shoot. So I started with an ELB 500 TTL pack and head strobe system. Uh, I worked in manual as I am most of the time I do. You can work in TTL if you're more comfortable with that. I find manual really simple. Uh, also was uh, the EL Skyport HS, uh, which allows me to control the power of the strobe from the camera position, which is really handy. Of course, you can, you know, just walk over and dial it up on your pack or on your mono head if you don't have that. Uh, as long as you have some way to remotely trigger, wirelessly trigger your flash, then you're good to go. Um, this uh, light, this portable head requires a little adapter to fit the light modifier on. Uh, and to do that, I um, the modifier that I used rather was the Ellen Chrome 27.5 Deep Oct. Now, if you guys follow me on this channel, you probably have seen this rig before because this is kind of my go-to location lighting setup, especially for shooting fashion and portraits. It works really brilliantly. It's really light. Sometimes I will have a second strobe that I'll use as a backlight. Um, but in this case, I didn't need that. I wanted to keep it really simple. Uh, and so one light was was able to suffice. Now, I will say one of the things that I really like, I know uh, that some people prefer a mono head and I've worked with mono heads. A mono head, for those of you that don't know, is a strobe that has everything built in. All of the electronics and this flash tube are all built into one unit that is compact. However, what can happen with those, in my experience, is if they tip over uh, and they hit the ground, then you're out of, out of luck. Uh, basically, if that breaks, you're out of business. So what I like about having a separate head and pack uh, is that if the flash were to take a dive and hit the dirt, I can just use another flash head in its place. I have all, uh, you know, I have op additional heads with me when I shoot, so I could swap out a, a new head for one that got broken. Meanwhile, the pack is still intact. That hasn't had any damage to it, if it uh, because it's not going to fall. It's going to be strapped to an assistance waist or their side or uh, set down on the ground. Okay, so that is some of the gear. Now I want to talk a little bit about the grip because that's also important. How are we holding that light? Typically when I'm working on location in cities and munici municipalities and stuff, I'd, I try to avoid light stands when at all possible because that's when uh, you know you can run afoul of permitting regulations and you know insurance issues and things like that. So for this I always use a shoreline paint pole with a KC adapter. That's a, the adapter that you're seeing there on the right. Uh, that screws right to the end of the paint pole. It's got a 5 8 adapter at the uh, top of it and that allows you to clamp down your strobe right onto it. Works brilliantly. And again those Ellen Chrome heads are super duper light, um, which is another thing that I really prefer about only having the strobe in the head and not all the electronics is it's much lighter. As light as some of the best monoblocks are, uh, they also, they're not as light as these. So that's one of the reasons I prefer them. Balancing ambient and flash is actually pretty simple once you understand it. So with ambient and flash, you have two independent sources of light. Okay, you've got ambient and you've got flash, and each is controlled separately. Ambient contribution is controlled by the shutter speed, 
and flash contribution is controlled by flash power setting and aperture. This is a little reversed here in my slide because it to if aperture is to a lesser extent because typically when you set your aperture you want to set it and leave it alone, especially when you're doing the kind of shooting that we were, that I'm doing in this uh, in this presentation because uh, you know you you want to mitigate distracting background elements most of the time you're going to be shooting with wider aperture so you want to set that aperture leave it alone and you don't really want to use your aperture to control flash power that much typically you're going to be using the flash power setting to do that rather than the aperture so it's true that aperture does control but only to an extent like you're going to set your at your aperture and you're going to leave it alone and then you're going to require on the power output of that pack of that flash to control uh, how much flash is being contributed to the exposure, all right? So again, just to put a finer point on it, ambient is controlled by shutter speed and flash is controlled by the power of the flash setting, the setting for the power that you, for the flash that you dial in and to a lesser extent, the aperture that you set because you're going to set that and forget it. Regarding flash exposure control, you have a few different ways that you can work, okay? You have manual flash control, TTL flash control, and then high speed sync. All right, let's look at each. So manual is really dead simple. Basically with manual flash control, all that you're doing is you are dialing up the control of that flash, the power of that flash manually, right? Makes sense. You just either, if you want more light, you dial it up. If you want less light, you dial it down. It's really as simple as that. I know a lot of people are intimidated by manual, but it could not be more simple. It's a lot easier, I think, than TTL. All right, let's talk about TTL. With TTL, TTL handles the exposure calculations for you. So it's going to give you a great starting point, but that's kind of where it leaves off. Then it's up to you to fine tune and season to taste the exposure to make it yours because you may want to change the balance of flash and ambient there. And you're going to do that in essentially the same way. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, there are some different ways that you're going to do it, but it is essentially the same. When it comes to the ambient light, you are still going to be using shutter speed. The only difference is the way that you are going to control the power of the flash. I I'll cover it now. It when you're using TTL, uh, rather than uh, dialing the flash down manually, you are going to be using flash exposure compensation because those because the camera is going to be setting that for you. So then you kind of need to override it using flash exposure compensation. That's just a little plus and minus button typically on your camera body, and you will uh, you work in um, it, I think you have one to three stops plus or minus one to three stops uh, of uh, flash exposure compensation that you can work with. So that gives you quite a bit of latitude to either either increase or decrease the amount of flash in the exposure. And lastly is high speed sync, okay? A high speed sync is really, really key when it comes to shooting with wide apertures and, and flash together um, and reducing ambient light because what high speed sync allows you to do is it allows you to use shutter speeds with while you're using flash to use shutter speeds that are faster than the maximum shutter speed rated for your camera when you're using when you're using flash okay so typically that's like 1 1 60th or 1 1 80th or 1 200th uh, when you're using high speed sync you can work all the way up to 1 8000th of a second and that allows you to really take reduce a tremendous amount of ambient light okay and that's important because you don't have to use your aperture to do that so let's say you're using flash and you're and you want to use a wide aperture you'll have way way too much light and you would need to stop your lens down significantly in order to reduce the amount of flash coming into the camera high speed sync gives you another method you you don't have to rely on your aperture okay you can use the uh, shutter speed in order to do that. So you can really, really increase the shutter speed significantly and still work with wide apertures. And that is particularly important and useful uh, in portrait work um, where you have distracting backgrounds, portrait work on locations where you want to reduce distracting background elements. You want to kind of get that nice bokeh that everybody loves. That's how you do it. So that is high speed sync. The way that I like to work is typically to establish the ambient exposure prior to introducing the flash, okay? This allows me to see exactly what's going on before I ever turn the flash on. And I really, because the, the ambient light is the dominant light source 
uh, in the image, in the case when we're mixing, when we're balancing ambient and flash. That is the dominant light source, is ambient. So the flash is the secondary light source. So many times, and in some of the images that you're gonna see in this presentation, and this shoot, what I do is I underexpose the ambient to create drama or hold highlight detail, like the skies that you're gonna see in this image. By underexposing the ambient, we're really able to uh, have a great effect and really hold all that detail and bring in very dramatic skies, lots of clouds, and really looks cool. Um, so what I like to do then is measure and set the flash power to match the aperture being used or as desired. And then I can always season to taste. So simple enough, right? Okay, now there is another way that you can work, and I always, when I talk about measuring and setting the flash, I'm doing that with a handheld light meter. So let's talk about that for a minute because there is another way that we can do this, and that is by using percentages. If you look at the picture of this meter, and this is the meter that I use, uh, you will see here that there is a percentage reading here. Okay, so the meter will tell you how much flash is being contributed to an exposure. Now, this is a stock image and it shows 90%. That would be way too much. That would typically be in the studio and uh, it would probably be about 100, not 90. Uh, but when I am on location, a good starting point is 20% for flash. Uh, you want 20% of the exposure is from flash. Okay, that creates a really nice balance, and that's a great place to start if you want to work with percentages. And sometimes I do, uh, but in this shoot, I, I did, uh, I just metered to match the aperture that I had on the camera, right? And that got me exactly what I wanted. So, just another way to work, but I always advocate using a flash meter, they're a great tool. One of the benefits of working with a flash meter is that you are able to get exposures like this the first time that you click your shutter because you've already metered everything. So you're off and running really quickly, okay? This was the first exposure, or one of the first exposures that I made, all right? And in this, uh, I've got the uh, shutter speed is a little bit lower. It's a slightly underexposed, maybe a half a stop. Um, so it's got a really kind of nice dramatic look to it, all right? And the flash is set to match that aperture that I'm using on the camera. So again, you're using aperture to control the amount of ambient light, and then you are dialing in your flash to match that aperture. Okay, it's pretty simple stuff. So throughout the images that we're gonna look at now, you're gonna see just by, and I pretty much maintain the same flash power throughout the images that you're gonna see. All that I'm doing is I'm varying the amount of ambient light by either using a faster shutter speed for less ambient light, or a slower shutter speed for more ambient light. And once you exceed your camera's max sync speed, shutter speed for using flash, uh, many of today's TTL systems will switch automatically into high speed sync. Now I was shooting with a medium format with a leaf shutter lens, so I don't have to worry about that. But if you're working with DSLR, TTL is your go-to when you wanna use uh, shutter speeds that exceed your sync setting, okay? Your maximum shutter speed for your camera, all right? That's gonna allow you to really knock down or reduce that ambient light and create really cool dramatic looks. All right, let's take a look through these images. Okay, so here is another image. Now again, my flash power is exactly the same, but what I've done is I'm dialed in a slower shutter speed that has allowed in a lot more ambient light and created a, a more even balance between ambient and flash. So, you know, one light, uh, we've got two zones of light, essentially because we've got our ambient and we've got our flash and we're controlling them independently and we can create a variety of looks uh, only by changing that one setting. Really cool. Aperture is the same. Everything's the same. Flash power is the same. But my, but my shutter speed is what I have varied here to create a very different look. And here's another one, just like that. Same kind of look. Here I've darkened it just slightly. Now here we've got a very different look. Here I've darkened it down. I've increased my shutter speed. And it's only gonna get darker from here. There we go. Okay, so here I'm working with a much faster shutter speed. I don't remember what it was, but it's getting up there and it's really pulling in all of that cloud detail. And when you're working with TTL, you really don't have to worry about it because whatever you dial in, you're gonna be okay because you've got, or rather high, a high speed sync rather, because high speed sync's got you covered. So that's, if you want this kind of look, if you want very dramatic things, definitely use high speed sync. It's gonna allow you to shoot with really fast shutter speeds, knock down that ambient light, use 
choose wide apertures, um, and then you just dial in your flash power to whatever you want. All right. Now I had already set this up, kind of dialed it in. I got a, I got a good starting point by, as I said before, when I'm doing my setup, I just take an overall exposure before I ever turn my flash on, underexpose a little bit, turn on the flash, measure it to match the aperture, and I'm off to the races. And then I am able to season to taste using the shutter speed to vary the looks, which I'm doing here. So, and again, now we're kind of more on the moody dark end of the spectrum where I'm working with faster shutter speeds in order to create this kind of look. Okay, and there are a couple other alternatives images. Here we go. And I believe that is our last shot. I love this shot, really fun to play with perspective. But as you can see here, again, I've opened up just a little bit uh, to let a little bit more ambient in, um, but it's still got that dark moody look. I'm still working with a really fast shutter speed, faster than I could um, if I was working with DSLR, faster than I could without high speed sync. And it allows you to create this really cool, dramatic kind of image using flash and ambient together and mixing them in the way that you want. Okay, so let's take a look again at where we started and uh, the, the variety of images that we're able to create. Again, I wanted to end with this, just showing you, you know, what we can do. We've got two very different qualities of light here and we're able to do both just by the way that we are controlling the balance between uh, flash and ambient and we're doing it just with shutter speed. All right, so shutter speed is the big takeaway. Use it to control your ambient light. Set your flash, you're off to the races. Go out and try this stuff. It's really fun. It's not as complicated as you might think. I can't wait to see what you do. Tag me on Facebook, and I will see you next month here at BehindTheShutter.com and Shutter Magazine.